Ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm going to um, attempt to grapple with this um, famously gnarly, um, but famously important aspect of, uh, of modeling, uh, of dynamic modeling in general, uh, but which has particularly bite to it when it comes to agent-based modeling. And what I'm going to try to do here is to articulate a set of um, considerations and, and uh, emphases that I think will be helpful when you're thinking about model conceptualization. But I'm also going to be, to be specifically going through some specific descriptions associated with, um, with uh, ways of uh, characterizing models that can be useful at a very practical level um, and some principles to live by when it comes to modeling um, that can really ease, um, can, can help avoid risks with modeling projects. Um, so I had referred to a lot of the the sort of key points here at some level before to kind of get them out there um, to you. And I noticed that, noted that like maps, uh, models are simplifications of the world. They leave out a lot of detail of necessity. And they're valuable precisely because they do leave out that detail. Just as, you know, we don't want a map that's, that's thousands of pages in length to get us from one area of the city to the other, however, richly that might describe the various yards on the way and so on. We, we want something that cuts the chase. But more than that, light maps, models are specific to purpose. And I said that, that what you leave out depends on the purpose of the model, the goal of the model. Um, you know, George Box, uh, the eminent statistician, once said, you know, um, all models are wrong, some are useful. Um, uh, and, you know, Einstein once said, you want something as simple as possible, but no simpler. <laughs> and those are good general high-level principles um, to avoid getting caught up in, in you know, um, uh, in, in needless worrying that you've left something out of, you know, the, the actual situation. Um, uh, that, that you want to be quite specific in shaping your model by, by the problem. Um, in attempts at perfect representations of real world systems, you know, they offer, I, I, I say it here, offer little value, but what I really mean is that it's almost always the kiss of death for a modeling project to try to, you know, fully represent this system. I'm going to characterize, you know, exactly the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the healthcare, um, the healthcare situation for retired veterans or what have you. Um, so establishing a clear model purpose is absolutely critical for, for defining what's included in a model. And when I say a clear model purpose, this could be a set of purposes. What are you trying to achieve with this model? You know, are you trying to achieve mere, st you know, uh, get stakeholders dialoguing and having a change of perspective? Um, are you trying to under quantitatively understand policy impacts and cost effectiveness, um, you know, are you trying to explain historic trends that have been seen without trying to examine counterfactual situations? Being clear about what, what you're trying to get at with the model or, or the small set of purposes is important. And um, for any of them, you're going to want to think about the model boundary, what goes in and what, what is left out of the model. We'll come back to this distinction a bit later. Um, and a key thing to realize is less is more. Sometimes adding factors often does not yield greater insight. Adding factors in can obscure insight. Um, I have one um, close colleague um, who uh, did her work at Michigan, um, uh, which is a, uh, uh, a center uh, worldwide of, um, of, of agent-based modeling. Um, uh, and uh, she uh, built a uh, descriptively rich agent-based model for her dissertation work to shed light on the complex interaction of two, uh, two health conditions. Um, 
And uh, she did so with an age-based model. Um, and the problem was that the model accreted so many different factors, she couldn't really secure insight effectively from it. There were just so many things going on. You'd be running it, you'd see output of different sorts, and you'd wonder, you know, where did this come from? Where did this emergent behavior arrive? And to try to track that down, you would have to engage in the most intricate of experiments and disable all sorts of factors. And, um, and you know, sometimes there'd be a lack of conviction as to whether that output, that strange output, is that a bug in the model? Is it an implementation issue? Like this thing gets updated before that thing rather than vice versa? And she actually found her model was so rich, she couldn't reason through what was going on with it. And she ended up putting in place a much simpler model. She actually took that and, and she put that model aside. She put it in the parking lot and she built a super simple model. It was just the most stylized thing imaginable. That didn't mean putting aside all the empirical evidence. She, she tried to draw in the literature for uh, germane to it. But it was much of, you know, orders of magnitude simpler model. And she found that gave her great insight and gave her some take homes and some ahas. And it was much easier to communicate to people and it was much uh, easier to gain confidence it was working and so on. And this taught her a big lesson. And sometimes less is more. And sometimes um, uh, having, having a, uh, you know, modest expectations and working towards those um, will gain more than you know, working towards the kitchen sink and expecting, you know, great insight once you finally get there. Um, uh, so often the simplest models give the most penetrating insight because you realize, oh, I mean, I can explain this just with these two factors. It's kind of like the shelling segregation model, for example, or the sugar scape model, or, or models associated with um, Conway's Game of Life, or, or or the beer game and system dynamics or others that, you know, just these couple factors um, can yield some really interesting phenomenon, can account for this or point out the risk with this sort of policy. Um, and the other thing is, of course, putting effort into a more complex model um, can take time away from insight um, for using it. Um, so the modeling process is an articulated process and it inevitably involves uh, learning and going back and re-examining things. And I often show it here at the problem conceptualization phase. There's a problem mapping phase, which in agent-based modeling has traditionally been under-resourced, mapping out qualitatively what's going on or semi-qualitatively. There's a big emphasis in system dynamics. We sketch out systems before we build models. And uh, this is something I like to emphasize in agent-based modeling. And I'll talk with you how, if you're interested. Um, but problem mapping, sketching things out roughly, in my view, is very handy before you go and you buckle down and you, you build a model. Um, as you'll hear, I'm a big believer in this whole thing being an incremental process. And so, you, you don't build the model once and you know build it for two years and then you have your great your great model. Instead, you build it up and you learn and you go back and re-examine the modeling, maybe um, the, the mapping, and maybe you examine the conceptualization. At some point, you have a model where you have some degree of confidence and often you engage in calibration processes, sensitivity analyses, et cetera. Um, to sort of uh, evaluate it, um, sometimes structural, sometimes in terms of parameters. Uh, you engage in, in, in testing along with that, and sometimes the um, boundary between these isn't uh, fully clear, and you engage in some uh, policy discourse or examination of, of some of the, the findings you're trying to get out of the model and, and knowledge translation. This is a, a common progression. And you know, in system dynamics and in my world, um, mental models are key. So you're always re-examining your understanding of the situation. So maybe you build a model and you calibrate it and it just doesn't, it doesn't add up. It won't account for certain important features of the empirical data. You go back and you change your mental model and you say, maybe I need to add this factor in. Or maybe I've been misrepresenting this process and you go back 
and then try advancing that to calibration again. We'll be talking about many of these proceeds, like calibration sensitivity analyses, later. This, by the way, this diagram is not specific to agent-based modeling. I've made some comments on here that have elements of agent-based modeling, um, you know, uh, 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 interactions, messaging, and handlers. But by and large, this whole thing applies with system dynamics modeling um, or discrete event simulation. In discrete event simulation, normally this process is less iterative. Traditionally, they have more invested in uh, industrial engineering sort of successive waterfall approach where they build a model and they test it and they evaluate it. And there's not as much iteration. In, in uh, agent-based modeling, uh, as practiced by some practitioners, there's more iteration. Micro simulation, it tends to be more one way. Um, uh, system dynamics, uh, there tends to be a lot of iteration with some projects take it most um, one way. So this is an, el you know, an element of the modeling process. We'll be going through some of these um, throughout the course of the week. Um, Okay, now this is a key point for the sake of the particular focus of this event. With agent-based models, the need to be clear about the goals of the model. You'll hear people use different terms for this. The research question, the problem you're trying to solve, the, the model purpose. People use different terms for this. Some of them a little bit more constrained. Like I, I have a lot of colleagues who are modelers who will talk about the research question. But not all the people that use my models are researchers. I do a lot of work with system practitioners. And they don't like to talk about the research question because they, they think of it as quality improvement processes. This isn't, this isn't you know, academic research. Um, um, sometimes also you have a different goal than the research question. You have a goal of bringing together these stakeholders bring together this indigenous community um, to, to discuss these issues that, are, that uh, have been uh, tearing at it. And you're not after a research question in some sort of academic sense. Um, so I like to talk about model purpose or goal more generally. Um, but regardless of how you characterize it, there's a special risk here with ABMs. Because with ABMs, you have enormous flexibility you have enormous capacity to build a model with, with easy you know, addition of any given feature. It often is fairly straightforward to just you know, say, oh, what the heck, let's throw it in. Let's throw it in. Let's throw it in. Let's add that. Um, nominally, it's easy. Mechanically, it's easy. Now, in terms of getting the evidence for it, in terms of understanding what it means in terms of articulating how it interacts with other things. That's often not easy. But at a mechanical level, it's, it's not hard to just add another parameter in or add another aspect of state. And the problem is that this can get you down a, a, a path that's very dangerous because you, add, you end up in these arbitrarily rich models. And that's what happened to my call in our dissertation. Um, in a model that was supposed to be her dissertation model. And she ended up putting it aside. And she did not use that. That did not appear in her dissertation. There was no word of it in her dissertation. I know, because I've gone through an admiration of what was in her dissertation, which was about a much simpler model. So just be aware, with ABMs, it's much easier to add things in. For those familiar with other traditions, for example, you know, I, I've been doing system dynamics modeling for uh, 25 or more years now. And I will tell you, this issue is much worse with it yet. Because with system dynamics, it is harder to add in many factors. There's the, the nature of the description, the mode of description, um, means it's a heavier weight process to add in an aspect of heterogeneity. Let me give you an example. You have an aggregate model, and you decide I want to take age into account in this model. I have a model, maybe it's a you know, model of diabetes progression. And we have weight categories, and we have prediabetes, and we have you know, uh, frank type 2 diabetes, and uh, maybe one or two levels of complication, microvascular, microvascular complication. 
Okay, now you want to add in age to that. Well, you have to go through every stock of that model and every flow of that model and all the things that take output from that. And you're going to need to subscript them all by age. And you're going to need to have progression between those different age groups uh, captured in that model. In short, there's a lot of work there. And so you tend to treat it with great gravity. It forces you to think about it carefully. It doesn't only force you to make a good decision about it, but it forces you to think about it, to be conscious of, do I want to do this? Agent-based model, you drag in a parameter called age. We have age now. Everyone can have an age. OK, um, mechanically easy. What is the consequence of this for model understanding? What's the, what are the implications of this about how age impacts certain factors in the model? You know, contact patterns, for example, hygienic practices, what, or, or levels of self-care for someone with diabetes, or, or, or what have you. So, so with ABM, it's easy to, to, to go down a direction where you end up getting stuck because you, are, you have so many things in the model, you're not sure which end is up and what is influencing what and what's yielding the behaviors. Um, so it's really easy to add levels of detail. Um, and uh, a, a colleague of mine commented on this, <coughs> now a colleague, a student, um, uh, Kurt Kruger, who uh, was one of my PhD students who graduated uh, last year. <coughs> And Kurt said, so he was, he was the first working with the Ministry of Health, first person working with the Ministry of Health to build a model of ED weights and patient flow um, across the system. Uh, and he first built a system on model, model, which is, I often like to build a system on Unix model first at a high level to kind of think through a lot of the issues. And he, he first built that, built it with stakeholders. And he was getting better and better understanding of the system, and he was trying to add it into the system dynamics model. And he was talking with me about the challenges he was having. He was saying, I don't know if now would be a good time to go to an agent-based framework. And I said, look, Kurt, you're really talented at this sort of modeling. Uh, he was talented at both sort of modeling. He said, take a week and try it at an individual level. Just try articulating this in an agent-based, or if you want to screw that simulation form, and just try it on for size, and see, get a qualitative sense for what it's like, and then you can make a more informed decision. So he did that, and he told me it was like going from walking in a set of tight corridors where he was going this direction, and then everything was constrained for him by system dynamics, and now he said he felt like he was running through a Saskatchewan field. The sky is wide open. Yeah, no concern. And, and that's liberating because it means we can do things more flexibly. We can add in heterogeneity. We can add in networks if we need to. We can add in geography. But then that's the question, do you want to? Is it wise? Is it judicious to do so? And fortunately, he, had a, he was far enough on the modeling trajectory that he was uh, capable of, of of understanding these trade-offs, and he did an excellent job with it, uh, as did UM, who, who uh, took that project to an entirely different level yet, one you'll be hearing about this week. Um, but um, the point is it's quite easy in agent-based modeling to add levels of detail. You have agents have adaptive behavior based on those contexts, sophisticated decision rules, many properties or attributes, and it's harder to say no. It's hard to say no because it's so easy to do, and the consequences are far off. You know that you, you don't you don't realize now just how you'll come to have your understanding of scope. Um, so there's an acute need to be clear and disciplined about model scope and to approach it in a more principled way. Um, so there's a principle in software engineering which I like to talk about, here. and it's a principle called Yagni. You ain't going to need it. Okay. And the idea here is start simple. I cannot overemphasize this. Start simple. You may aspire to a rich, empirically grounded, 
descriptively complex model for reasons that are specific to your project. That's fine. Start simple. Do not try to build that model up front because you, trust me, when you start the modeling project, this is always true, always true for me, when I start a modeling project, I am naive about the area of application. And I learn about it along the way. And if you build a rich model based on your, under, your naive understanding up front, that that model will be built in a naive way, in a way that incorporates the naive understanding. You plan it all out for up front, you, and then you execute on it, you will arrive at a model that doesn't capture the learning along the journey. You will build that model, and you'll be waiting a year for it, two years for it, or what have you, and time may, went, may run away with it, um, so it's, it's longer than anticipated. And then you have this model that's very rich that hasn't captured a lot of learning. It's much better to start simple, experiment with a model, run it, observe the results. You may say, this is not, this is, this is trivial, it's impoverished, it doesn't capture, you know, key features of this iteration. Fine, learn from what it does represent now. Learn, and that will sharpen your thinking. Because this is all about modeling as learning. It'll sharpen your thinking about the world and about how these systems interact. And then if you decide to add something in, it'll be based on a judicious understanding, a more judicious understanding, more, a more savvy understanding. So you know, add in as you develop confidence in understanding the model. Case in point, you can conduct sensitivity analyses. You could say, I'm thinking about adding this factor in. Um, right now, it's kind of implicitly represented. Let's do a test to see how big a difference it's likely to make if I add it in by doing a sensitivity analysis. And, and you do a very quick sensitivity analysis and you say, uh, maybe it's less of an important factor than I would have thought. Um, I'll put it aside right now and revisit it uh, later. So one thing I need to promote above all else here is incremental model development. Those who are in the room who are not familiar with and this will be the vast majority of non-TAs so who are not familiar with modern software development, you will recognize that, that modern software is made possible by a revolution in software creation that perhaps more than any other feature was enabled by the fact that in previous years, when I was a young man, um, I know my students might think I was, you know, they were hitting rocks together. And so, but uh, when I was a young man, ladies and gentlemen, software that was built, uh, we would design it carefully up front, we would envision it, and we would go build it, and uh, often it would take years longer than anticipated, many, many months longer than anticipated. The customer would go upset, the needs would change, that we're trying to address the software, competing software would come out and we have to change our features. And it just led to um, a lot of grief. And if there's one change that's led to today's revolution in software, it's arguably the single most important change. It's not the only one, but may arguably the most single most important is incremental software development. We build software in steps. It's called agile software development. And I'm a keen advocate of agile models. What this means is start simple, add things in, often discuss with stakeholders all through this process, show them what you've got. Show, and you may say, well, it's not ready. Well, it's, it's ready enough that you can get insight still from the stakeholder by looking at it. Um, you can show them what you do have. And you build it up as your understanding evolves. So it's incremental in the sense that you are adding things in based on your current understanding, not your understanding as it was at the beginning of the model project, that naive understanding. So, so great advantages are conferred by building this step-by-step this -step fashion. With each iteration, you modify the model in some small fashion. You add in a little feature, and you show it off in the stakeholders. You run it, and you experiment with it. You see, how did that alter behavior of the model? How did it alter 
the outcomes um, that I'm interested in. You don't think that this new one is the complete story, but it gets you clarity. When I added the factor, that was when I first started seeing these interesting oscillations, for example. And that, that gives you a clue of when you have a richer model, where those oscillations might, have, might be originating in the model. My colleague in grad school, she didn't do that. She built the model up and kept on building, kept on building, kept on building, the plan model, and there it is. It's great. But all those features are in there, and so when she saw odd behavior, didn't know where it was coming from, like which interaction of features. If you're building it up along the way, you know, because you first started seeing this behavior here, or here, or here. Um, you didn't see it before you did this, or what have you. And another great process here that's talked about in obscure areas of the Asian-based modeling literature is to dock new versions of the model against older versions. The idea is you add something in, maybe you disable it, and you make sure the model gives the same results as before, and then you enable it and you see, see the results. So this is called docking. It's, it's sort of a way of making sure you haven't broken the rest of the model by adding something in. And then you um, can enable and you can see how did it change, change the behavior. Um, the great thing is these incremental versions can be shown to system stakeholders. If you build confidence on the part of system stakeholders, the model's coming along. And often you can get insights on the part of system stakeholders. One of the things you'll realize is that that we have our cognitive implementations, um, and often by before we see it, we can't fully envision it, even, even good modelers. But especially system stakeholders, you may describe what you're going to be doing, but they don't really get it until you show them something. You say, well, this is, this is what I've got. And they'll say, no, that's totally off base. That isn't how you character. Great, that's a step forward. You realize something that heads off a lot of grief. Um, by realizing it early, right? Um, or you get feedback and they say, well, that's pretty much what I had in mind, but you're missing this thing, or you gotta add in an asymptomatic category, or you know, um, you should refine this name to something else. So, um, you know, often you get feedback on these from stakeholders, and you can run, and get understanding from running, like sensitivity analyses that takes you forward. So here are some benefits of incremental development. You have an understanding where model patterns emerge. Uh, you can change direction based on the learning. You can say, oh, you mean we can account for that feature that we thought would take much more mechanism with just these two causal pathways? Let's publish, right? Um, let's, let's, let's take this forward or let's, um, Let's let's take let's restrict the model where it's gonna needs to go because we've already got a salient account of of what's going on here. You can get feedback from stakeholders. Um, you can get them to examine the modern pattern model patterns, output patterns, and comments on it, or prioritize what should be done next. This is a key aspect of incremental software development. You you ask stakeholders, what do you think should be done next? Given where we're at. What do you think, um, what, what, what do you think is, is most important? And sometimes they change mind from what they saw earlier based on what they've seen there. So you have greater clarity and prioritization. If there's a bug, if you introduce a bug, you can find it sooner. Bugs are an issue. You have a mistake in implementation. You do something silly. And you will spot it much faster with this than if you have the whole model, everything together, and who knows, what's going on beneath there. You add something in and the model breaks. It, it crashes or it, or it outputs weird behavior. And you've only added one or two things so you can go and find it easily. What did I do that caused that weird thing? Time boxing, look, if you've only got a year, this is the way to do it. You always have something in hand. You're not saying, oh, in nine months, 10 months, we'll have the model. You, you always have something in hand. Someone gets sick. A stakeholder leaves town, you got something in hand. You always have something in your pocket. Uh, and you have enhanced stakeholder confidence because they see the model coming along. Often it excites them. And you have improved morale on the part of developers and the part of stakeholders um, and it imp imp improved by it. Okay, so those are some comments on this whole idea of incremental development. Um, building things in pieces 
hopefully subject to a lot of feedback along the way and a lot of learning by running the model, by, by trying it out. Um, people may or, may or may not have viewed some of my videos and model building online, but in boot camps, I built things in an incremental way. I said, let's add this and let's run the model now. Let's see what happens. It's, it's because this is how, how learning often emerges. Um, and it's safe for we'll spot problems, et cetera. Okay. So those are some comments on this principle of, of building things early and, and uh, doing so in an incremental way subject to feedback and subject to, um, to run. I want to highlight the fact that there's something I need to mention. This is actually a really important point that didn't sink in for me as model until recent years. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, I speak about modeling as inviting critique or shaping our thinking in terms of learning in two major ways. One is just having a model that you could show to someone, get critique, and get critique as a step forward. It takes it out of our heads and puts it into the public sphere where we can work. we can critique it and refine it. That's one way. A second way is by we can run the model, see its implications, and test do they jive with empirical evidence. So it's a two ways to model so. But one thing I didn't fully recognize is that System stakeholders, ladies and gentlemen, have a lot of tacit knowledge. They have a lot of tacit observations about a system. If you've worked in a hospital for 25 years as a you know, manager of nursing staff or, or the person responsible for the medicine wards or um, uh, those, uh, those in charge of the ED, You've picked up a huge amount of informal observation in the course of your years. And while you can elicit some of that by sitting down and talking with these people about their observations of the system, often there's a lot of it that's, that remains tacit, where they have trouble just thinking of it to mention. But you show them a running model in front of them. And that brings out this tacit knowledge. It brings out this extra level of knowledge that was there all along. It's just they, they didn't tap into it. It wasn't explicit in their minds. And um, as a result, often by getting something, however crude in front of them and showing it, you'll get new types of remarks. You'll have them say, like, um, you know, I've never seen a pattern like that. That looks to me unrealistic. Or that's a pattern I recognize because we used to see it until we put into place this different rounding system or something. Or they'll say, yeah, that is what we see in the busiest times. But, you know, it's off base in this regard. Um, and that doesn't come out until you show them a model's output and they try to match it to their experience. Then it reminds them of this tacit knowledge. That's what we found in the ED Weights and Patient Flow Project to a degree, is tacit knowledge is elicited by contact with a running model. So it's not merely you get feedback from stakeholders on the, um, the model structure. It's not merely you show them the model output and you get critiques um, of it at some high level. Often it's bringing out new, new tacit knowledge. And even a, very rough model will start to bring out those that tacit all. Okay. Now, I'd like to. So, any questions about those points before I, I jump into a, a bunch of principles that will shape the boundary, the scope of a model at any one time? Bearing in mind that we build this in the Any questions about what I've just said? So how, how would you uh, justify a simple, like mm -hmm. the simplicity of a model? Like how do we know which yeah. level should we start? Okay, that's a very good question. And I have a slide or two later that, that talks about this. The, 
There's many ways in which modelers approach this issue. Um, some modelers, um, I'm, I'm actually quite fond of Ross Hammond's characterization. There's models for theory building, and there's models for theory exploitation. Okay? So when you are when when you are in a situation where you have well well understood theory and you want to understand the implications of that theory, say for intervention design, you engage in a type of modeling for theory explication that's rather different than if you're trying to build theory about an, an area. You're trying to you're trying to understand what what elements of the situation are shaping things out there at a, at a more basic level? And often the models for theory building are far, far, far simpler. Because you're really using it as kind of a, a thinking tool for, you know, it's often as simple as if I posit A and I posit B as another process, and I examine each in isolation, then I have them interact. Like, what, what results? And, and often, I mean, that sounds so trivial as to maybe not be worth doing, but believe me, it's worth doing because we often miss these things, you know. Um, you know we have, you know, there's a, a case finding procedure and, and a treatment procedure and um, maybe, maybe it's contact tracing and, and treatment for TB or something like that. And um, you, you, you want to understand, you know, perhaps um, how does how does uh, the features of the contact tracing process end up affecting, you know, the timeliness to treatment or or um, the, the prioritization of the, the contact tracing? How does that affect um, the uh, the transmission in the community? Sometimes, um, sometimes though, it's even easier than that. It's like. Um, you know, if, if you have a model without mortality being assumed, a closed population, a cohort being followed versus one that has mortality you know, or that, that it's an open population, you have people coming in, how does that change the spread of infection? Now that you have susceptibles coming in. Or maybe it's something like the shelling segregation model where you just pause it. People have preferences to live near people who look like them and um, and uh, as a result of those preferences, um, if uh, they, they can move to areas where they foresee themselves as being um, more preferred, and, you know, areas with other people like them. If you, if you put those two together, you know, preferences uh, based on people around them and choice of where they live based on those, some amazing patterns reminiscent of segregation can come about with very modest preferences. And it's not saying that that's a, a great model of Detroit and segregation in Detroit or, you know, in LA or, or, um, or you know, what we see in, um, in Atlanta, but it's, it's something which is very powerful because it suggests that this phenomenon we see of, of, of segregation in the world, um, uh, it can be produced through very modest preferences and very simple processes. We don't, we, in order to explain certain patterns we see, we don't have to posit, you know, a whole laundry list of different things that are operating to produce that. Sometimes it can be produced through very simple interactions. And we have this in system dynamics in a big way. For example, the BAS diffusion model, or the um, you know the SIR model in, in, in mathematical epidemiology. These are very simple models, but they capture certain effects. For example, you know there's certain regimes where um, where the infection will take off, and then there's uh, other situations where some combination of how quickly you recover from the disease or the uh, uh, the the uh, probability of transmission or contact rate, um, uh, those end up leading it to die out, and and you know you can come up with things like the basic reproductive number, basic reproductive constant, that are incredibly insightful um, sort of summaries of the situation just from that thinking model. Now is the SIR model a great depiction of you know uh, 
uh, flu and seasonal flu in Saskatoon? No, but it, it, it allows us to reason more reliably about how certain factors fit together that is germane to, um, uh, to uh, the spread of, of influence in Saskatoon. So um, there are certain purposes for models to help us think through that I build models just to sharpen my thinking. I'll give you another example. I, um, some years ago, we had a quite, we have a, had a quite active line of research in um, uh, diabetes in indigenous communities in Canada. We have all a series of papers on this. And, um, and we also have some models um, of this. And one of the things you notice is a marked and a frightening increase in the number of cases over time. But if you look at the actual data at a detailed level, you may see upswings for a certain amount of years and then precipitous declines, and then upswings and then precipitous declines. And you know, one of my questions was, are those declines, could they be explained simply because we're looking at age-specific data? Um, maybe there's some sort of cohort effect that you know, if a bunch of cases with it come in, and then a bunch of those cases age out of that age category it will decline the apparent rate. So I built a little model that was trivia, you know, had increasing rate over time, hazard rate of developing end stage renal disease, but it was summarized in age specific categories. And I ran the model and I saw exactly those patterns come out. It's like the patterns I see apparently like, very well accounted for. And then I said, okay, I don't have to worry that those patterns have declined are something big I've missed. I can explain them in an easy way. Um, and so often I build these models for simple explanation, and that was an asset for that for the, a paper that came up, actually. That we, in fact, we have an easy explanation for why these are declining. Um, by contrast, there's other models we're doing quantitative policy trade-offs. Uh, you know, I spend quite a bit more time refining them. So, um, you know, it depends, are you building a model to sharpen thinking and to theorize about it, to, to, to outline some stylized characterization that illuminates some, some principles um, of the underlying situation, or are you trying to address a certain epidemiological context, a very specific policy context in a quantitative way? That's a big question. Um, I'm very fond of, of Carl Simon, an eminent modeler who's recently retired from Michigan. <coughs> I'm very fond of his <coughs> characterization. He talks about caricature models. So everyone in here will be familiar with political cartoons, right? So they'll show the Prime Minister of Canada with a giant jutting jaw, you know, um, or, or they'll show, you know, George Bush with George W. Bush with giant ears, right, um, sticking out the, the side. And, and the idea is it brings out certain features of the situation that make, um, it exaggerates those to, to, to carry, you know, clear message. you immediately recognize that's George Bush there, you know, um, you know, riding the cruise missile or something like that. Um, and uh, you can immediately recognize certain features. It brings out certain underlying features um, in a, yes, in an exaggerated way, but in a way that that makes some point or makes some um, makes something clear. And so these stylized models are caricature models. We build them to sharpen thinking, to hone our understanding, because we need it. Because otherwise, our thinking falls prey to oversimplification, like gross oversimplifications. We go around thinking the world is linear. And it comes out and smacks us in our head. And sometimes you show a model with just two features that exhibits amazing behavior or unexpected behavior. That's a contribution. Um, and it's not that it's a depiction of you know, this particular epic context, but it may, it may capture certain indelible underlying truths about about a situation or capture an easy way of explaining certain phenomenon or, uh, or certain features that otherwise would be missed in a, in a situation. So we often, we often build models as thinking tools like that um, to build theory, as it were, 
Um, and they just need to be treated differently in how we publish them than models that are theory rich. We have a long history of publishing models um, if you're interested in talking about how do you present it. But don't try to try to make clear when you go to publish something like this what its purpose is. You don't say this is a model of, you know, uh, of uh, the situation for pertussis in Canada when it's really a little toy model that, that only captures features of the situation. You need to emphasize what it's what its goals is, what it's trying to trying to accomplish, um, and and that's very different from model to model. Okay, um, those are some comments. I'll see if I can come back to this uh, to this point though. So, what would lead you to put something in a model or not? This is a little bit of what you're asking. Um, wh why would you put something in there? And one of the features. So I'd like to talk about models and maps. That's one of my nicer analogies. I, I like that analogy. Um, but I have to tell you that there's, there's a limit to that analogy, as there is to all analogies. And the, the, an important limit there is often with a map, it's pretty obvious what features we can leave out. With a model, it's not always obvious what features we can leave out. Because there's a bunch of considerations as to why we need to put them in. With a map, it's often easy to know. You know Look, if I want to drive from the airport to here, I don't need a map that shows every blade of grass in Saskatoon. I mean, it's, it's obvious. But if, if I want to accomplish certain goals of the model, what does that imply? What does it adumbrate in a possible model that needs to be in there? That's not so easy. So let me articulate a couple things which motivate this, OK? Um, um, are there certain? key interventions of policies you need to represent for the purpose of the model. Maybe the model is to assess the impact of harm reduction versus change prescription practices and lowering the burden of overdose deaths in Canada from opioids. Okay? Um, or maybe you're interested in understanding the impact of condom distribution compared to Needle, uh, needle replacement uh, drives compared to, um, you know, to enhance screening for HIV, um, HIV reduction, um, HIV burden reduction. Um, if you have certain interventions that as part of the model goal you need to represent, you need a model that captures generative pathways, effects of those interventions, at least at some level. So if I'm going to represent condom prevention, I sure as heck got to have something about, for, for, and it's impact on HIV, I've got to have something about sexual transmission for HIV. I mean, if, if I don't have any sort of sexual contact in the model, how am I, how am I going to know if providing condoms helps or not, right? It, um, and similarly, if I, if I want to characterize you know, the impacts of, uh, of you know, uh, um, uh, uh, heroin delivery program for Recovering for, for individuals who are at risk of overdose that provides you know medically certified heroin on a daily basis um, to them, um, I, I need to to talk something about the dynamics of overdosing and how many overdoses that might um, might prevent requires me to understand how overdoses occur at a mechanical level. This is what these models are. They're mechanical models. They're models that capture positive causal pathways, generative pathways in the language of critical realism. Um, so one of the key questions is which interventions, uh, effects do you need to characterize um, or, or policies? And, th and this often shapes quite a lot features of our models because we're interested in addressing interventions. And like the model that Chin Yang will represent, that we'll be, uh, we'll be talking about, um, the fedora-clad student in the, in the second row there, um, her model scope was driven very centrally by this need to capture um, certain types of interventions for that model. It drove this multi-scale approach. Um, another question that people do ask is, you know, is there data available or understanding available, guiding theory at a particular level of analysis? Maybe, maybe you want to compare model output with available data 
that's longitudinal at an individual level and character. You want this model to be able to compare with data source that you have that's longitudinal from a longitudinal study of individuals, um, and it captures you know time to event data or what have you. You're not going to be able to compare it with model output from an aggregate model, an aggregate um, say system dynamics model. That ain't going to happen. That gives you a series of cross-sectional pictures, um, and all but the most sort of extreme um, situations. By the way, this is a mechanistic model of galaxy. Uh, um, uh, so, so data, like if you're planning to make you, like you have a key asset data-wise that you want to make use of as evidence, you want a model that will be able to be comparable to it or calibrate to it or align with it, often this will shape something about the boundary of your model. If this is, if you have data that, that requires a certain level of analysis, that's going to that's going to have implications uh, for your model. Um, and by implication, if all your data is aggregate data, um, it's not geographically tagged data and so on, do you really want to break your model up into cities you know, that are distinct? Um, you're not going to be able to compare it against comparable, um, comparable uh, data for each city. Um, you want to think really twice, do you want to do that? Yes, the real world has cities, but that doesn't mean they should be in our model. Any more so, the real world is grass, and that should be in our map from the, from the airport. Um, is there guiding theory? This is a, um, if their theory at an individual level as to how people make decisions, um, maybe it's broader models like stages of, of change, the trans-theoretical model. Maybe it's um, theory that's more mechanistic. Um, you know, about uh, uh, immune, uh, immune dynamics or, or dynamics involving um, insulin glucose system. If that's the case, um, that raises the possibility of characterizing something. But if there's not theory at that level, either we've got to do a model for theory building or we might deal with more aggregate depiction uh, of, that, of that level. We've got to decide, or as part of our goal, to inform, uh, inform that theory. Um, there are these interesting cases. It's interesting. I built this list based on a list I already have in discussion with another prominent modeler, Elizabeth Broom from, um, from Michigan. Um, and um, one of the things that she has emphasized is the disconnect between theory and data. So the idea is, look, sometimes you have data population level, but you have theory about behavior change or individual behavior at an individual level. And you need a model, you want a model that will connect the two. So you have individuals guided by you know, um, uh, their local visibility and kind of their, their bounded rationality or, or their decision making rules. And you want to understand the degree to which it can explain um, uh, data at a population level across many individuals. Um, this is uh, a, a notable um, motivation for some of her work. Um, you know, uh, in, within our uh, context of agent-based modeling, there's also questions, is heterogeneity uh, with respect to certain factors critical to understanding a process or a problem? I'll give an example. Um, within public health, we put a great deal of emphasis on equity considerations, right? It's not good enough to just have a policy that, you know, in some glib way has average good benefit for the population as a whole. We want a po policy that doesn't, that doesn't disadvantage certain groups, that, that doesn't put people at risk and throw them under the bus only to improve the health of those who are already healthy or, or advantaged. And sometimes within our models, this is a very potent factor. Um, we want to we want to place in the model some element of representation of heterogeneity to capture the transfer effects or differential effects on advantaged groups or disadvantaged groups. And so there it may be a compelling thing. Maybe you know for example women have a disproportionate burden, carry a disproportionate burden of certain, uh, certain um, health issues. Um, maybe it's, um, 
it's issues having to do with uh, you know asymptomatic uh, carriers for uh, infections. Maybe it's uh, aspects of of um, uh, mental health due to extra duties placed on them societally, and um, and you know capturing a model that that having a model that captures heterogeneity can be important because. One of my fears is, you know, a purely aggregate model that doesn't capture this heterogeneity. If we see a net gain for an outcome, the lingering fear is there. Well, maybe it's a net gain for society as a whole, but it disadvantages certain groups. There's transfer effects that our model's not capturing because it, it doesn't have ways of quantitating that, you know, this group is advantaged and this group is disadvantaged. So I find this a potent uh, consideration um, when it comes to equity. Um, and uh, finally, I'll just mention stakeholder judgment, like what, what stakeholders find um, acceptable or, or plausible or, um, um, or sort of willing, they're willing to buy in can be important. Um, so in other words, uh, if stakeholders just get totally maxed out by showing them a system on the MX aggregate model, whereas they really get engaged and can appreciate a model couched at a discrete event simulation level showing individual patients. To me, that's a potent consideration that you know, pushes me towards consideration of, the, um, of an individual level uh, formula, formulation here. Um, now, I want to distinguish, though, three levels so when I talk about model boundary, it's, it's easy to think about that in a dichotomous way, right? You, you have what's in the model and what's left out of the model. You know, here's our, here's our model and some things we put in a parking lot outside and some things we put in the model. It's often good to, by the way, say, we're gonna put that in the parking lot, we'll revisit it as our learning go goes by. It's not, you know, forever it shall be forsaken by this model, the things outside. But it's actually, a, it's actually a gross oversimplification and it disadvantages you if you think about the boundary purely in a dichotomous way. The fact is we often distinguish three levels, not, it's not dichotomous, trichotomous of, of inclusion, okay? And there's two levels of things that are included. And these are absolutely central distinctions that cut across all dynamic modeling traditions that are central to dynamic modeling as an enterprise. Endogenous factors versus exogenous factors. There are certain factors that we may leave outside of the model, at least for this iteration. Remember incremental. We're leaving it out for this iteration. But there's a key question. When we say it's in the model, is it in, in an endogenous factor or exogenous? Let me explain this. There are certain things that the model generates, it produces, it, it, um, it, it causes dynamics in these things over time. It is calculated. These are different words that point to the fact that there are some things that the model outputs, it gives to us. It generates them. We don't tell it um, what to make happen with an endogenous thing. It tells us what, what is the logical consequence of our assumptions in terms of endogenous things. So the dynamics are calculated as part of the model. They're generated by, to use Josh Epstein's term, in generative social science. Exogenous factors are things that are in the model, but we pre-specify. This doesn't always mean things that are constant. These could be time series. We say, assume this about the unemployment rate for the next 10 years. Or, you know, we're going to assume um, this level of, uh, of uh, age-specific fertility and this secular trend in it um, in a fixed way. We, we, we tell the model this. It's pre-specified. We tell the model what to assume about this. Um, we give it to the model. Endogenous things the model gives to us. This is its output. This is its, its emergent dynamics. And 
being very clear, when you're dealing with things in a model between endogenous things and exogenous things, it's important. What are you seeking for the model to produce? What are you seeking it to generate? Are you seeking overdose deaths to be generated by the model? Um, generally, the things that are endogenous are things that are cent more central to model purpose. Like if you model, we're seeking to understand trade-offs between policies as they affect overdose deaths. Overdose deaths better be endogenous because otherwise we're presupposing what we're trying to determine. You know, the model should be generating overdose deaths implied by our policies as part of it. By contrast, maybe there's some things in that model that are less central. Maybe it's prescription policies. Maybe we assume exogenous factors. We assume prescribing patterns that are characterized in this fixed and this pre-specified way. Um, we're not having the model endogenize that. Another model of, of, of uh, opioids might endogenous prescribing patterns. It might say, you know, a physician who has lost too many patients due to overdose deaths might might make their prescribing more cautious, or or maybe it would um, it would be something where um, uh, public health authority or, or health authorities end up um, imposing tighter restrictions once endogen once uh, overdose deaths reach a certain level. So often with models, um, uh, we will have a set of things that are endogenous that are more central to the model and things that are exogenous that we need to assume something about and which often have implications for the endogenous things but which are not themselves um, uh, produced. We, we pre-specify. So those models that we built yesterday or we saw yesterday, let's go take a look at this for example. Um, uh, here is uh, a model of a person's evolution. Give me, give me a factor in this model. I'll, I'll zoom in here. Give me a factor in this model that's, um, you know, I'll pull over to the right. What's a factor in this model that's endogenous? What's a factor that's endogenous here? Remember, endogenous things are things that the model gives to us. They're, they're generated by the model. They're calculated. So what things are, can you give me a few things that are endogenous here? Sorry? Energy intake. And it's endogenous. It's, 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 the energy intake is driven by a complex series of interactions between their preferences for those screaming yellow zonkers and the Tim Tim. Um, together with their distance from the nearest store, together with their decision-making patterns and the size of their barter or what, what they have, it, it results from a, a fairly large series of different factors. So energy intake is endogenous in this model. If we had just fixed it, if we said people take in 2,000 calories per day or 1,500 calories per day, if that was a fixed constant, it would be exogenous. But here it's endogenous. It's, it's itself resulting from the dynamics of the system and this complex decision making process, or quasi complex. Um, what's another thing that's endogenous here? Weight. Often the outcomes from models, almost always the outcomes are, are endogenous. Because if we pre specify our outcomes, we presuppose our, the, the conclusion to our findings, right? We, so endogenous factors are and often include outcomes and things that closely drive outcomes. So weight is the weight is 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 endogenous here. Um, good. What's something that's exogenous here that we pre-specify? Distance. Yeah, distances. Like we just have you know fixed park distances. We have fixed locations of superstores or superstores supermarkets and. <laughs> and um, and uh, you know convenience stores um, until I started clicking on them, right? Until I started putting them in, the seating them in there. Then they were quasi endogenous. Well, okay, um, it it had to respond to them dynamic, but it's it, it, even then I was pre I was specifying it to them, right? I was saying assume this, assume this, assume this. So that's exogenous. 
space. What's another thing that's It's rich. It's GIS space, but it's exogenous. And a lot of GIS things are exogenous. Not all. You might have deposition of prions in Paul's artful models of CWD. But, um, uh, but a lot of things from GIS are rich, um, powerful, but exogenous factors the location of resources, the walkability of the environment I'm in. Um, these, are, these are exogenous things. What's another exogenous thing? Number of meals. Okay, um, the number of meals they take per day, um, uh, that's, that's exogenous. The preference a given person has for convenience store meals, that's also, you could say, well, it's, as it turns out, it's generally in the model, but it's generated from a fixed distribution. I mean, it, it, for all intents and purposes, it's, it's uh, for a given person, it's something pre-specified, thou shall be, have this preference for Tim Tams. And, and they'll say, yes, ma'am, and, and, and they will have that preference. Um, so uh, same thing with the homes, which they're, they're not shifting homes based on where they can get you know, those uh, meat pies um, to, to position themselves, or position themselves, for that matter, close to fresh fruits and vegetables. Homes are, are fixed in the binding here. So often with a model, we do really well to be clear about when we say we're going to build a model of weight and the impact of the built environment, the food environment on weight over time, we want to be clear, like, what things are we seeking the model to produce here in our endogenous, which things exogenous, for each given round of development? And typically, ladies and gentlemen, as we incrementally develop models, um, we will shift things around between these. So sometimes things that were previously exogenous will become endogenous. We'll say, wow, it's really sensitive to um, you know, this feature of, um, of, of social networks. Social networks, like Chin Yang's model of, of e-cigarettes, um, it, it, there's a lot of sensitivity to social network effects. So then you might say, wow, okay, we've learned from the model by experimentation. It's very sensitive to these assumptions about social networks. Maybe I will add in dynamics of social networks because I want to see to what degree affiliative connections, my spending more time with certain people, maybe based on their behavior, might affect this. And then at some point, you may do a bit of experimentation. You say, uh, you know, this is too much too soon, or, or it's, it's uh, you know, it, it turns out not to be very sensitive to this, or, um, you know, uh, we, don't, we don't have the understanding to, to explore this in a, in a grounded-based way. It's not the central purpose model. Let's go back to it representing as exogenous. We sometimes have this kind of um, little bit of a dance where you, you examine something for a little bit as endogenous and say, ah, let's, but uh, you know, it's a bridge too far. Let's let's go back to exogenous. Okay. And um, and so uh, and then sometimes things that are ignored get put in the exogenous category. You broaden a little bit the model. Maybe to take into account based on stakeholder feedback. In this next version of the model, the stakeholder says, I'd really like for you to take into account um, availability of recreational spaces, not just parks. So things that are ignored about characteristics, um, uh, maybe we end up putting into exogenous factors or you know, neighborhood walkability, more generally, uh, sidewalk quality, we put into exogenous. And so this, this is a tripartite model. And if, if you want, you know, you could, you could view it as kind of, these are endogenous things, these are exogenous things, and these are, you know, ignored things out here. And so there's often, you know, some boundary crossing um, in different directions as we learn from the model. Um, and sometimes that involves shifting traditions. You know, something we've we've shown only in a in a very crude aggregate way. We want to make it endogenous, and we put into place 
uh, because it's so resource uh, rich and so on, involves a structured workflow we put into place with the discrete event simulation component. But crossing these boundaries is, is something that goes on between these successive rollouts of a model in this incremental development, where at all times you have something in hand, but you may get feedback from stakeholders or from learning from the model that it causes you to expand it a little bit or shift things around. Yes? So this is a real practical question. Yeah. Good question. Yeah, so are you saving each model as you're changing yeah. it? What do you tend to practice? Great, great question. So um, I can't remember if I have a slide about this. If I don't, I, I should be criticized for it. Because um, uh, one of the things I really like to emphasize is saving away successive model versions and, and having clear documentation and moreover, when you produce results, from what version of the model was that produced? So you're very clear, these results, like for this paper I just submitted, for example, um, those came from exactly this version of the model with these assumptions, and even down to the point of you know, this random number seed or what have you. And uh, we've actually, over the years, built tools with any logic that automatically record that information. So you actually run, if, if people are interested in this, like we could demo them, you actually run the model, it will save away, um, you know, a complete copy of the model you use. Um, it'll save away a screenshot of the results. It'll save away the parameter values and the random number of C used to create it in a kind of running log, as it were, for the model. Um, and like when someone like Jin Yang here, when she documents, uh, when she documents output from the model, um, or others from some of our, our other models. Um, generally, you know, you want to record what version was this using because let me give you a couple of reasons, right? One thing is total reproducibility, right? That's, that's a fundamental principle of science. You want to be able to reproduce it. If you get that conditional, you know, you get that revise and resubmit request from the journal, you want to be very clear about which version you want to go back to to run a few more scenarios per the reviewer's interest, right? Um, so you, you need to have that documentation in place at some level. A second thing is that if there's a bug discovered at some point, if you discover, God forbid, you know, that there's, there's a problem and, and you were calculating this wrong, right? Um, you want to know which versions of the model were affected by extension, which outputs from the model were affected, you know, like which results, like, was that conference presentation I just did? Was were those results tainted by this? You want to have a very, very clear understanding about you know um, which things were affected and which things uh, were not. Um, uh, it's also a good thing to capture motivations for changes to the model along the way. Like why did you add certain things, or patterns of interest and behavior observed, so you can. You know, okay, you know, this this pattern originated at this version model and you can get some understanding as, as to why that is. Um, so there's there's actually a whole set of what we call model traceability needs that um, that you'll want to try to capture. And over the years we built my group has built a number of tools um, to to enable this. One of my biggest regrets in critiques on the modeling software front is that package after package after package is still not up to par with providing that built-in support for that. Um, if you're interested in this more, I could have TA show you how to use any logic, for example, to save away successive versions of it. And certainly, I make heavy use of any logic's experiment which we've been using these, these scenarios where I try to keep an experiment um, once defined fixed. So, um, you know, if I have outputs from that experiment, I know, uh, and I, I know later, okay, that output I'm interested in was output from this experiment. I don't have to worry, it's changed out from under me. So generally, whenever we change a model that will alter its output, that 
you know, the output we've, we've, we've looked at, we'll give it a new version of it. Um, and so a version is like an immutable, it's, it's I'm actually slightly exaggerating because there's some subtleties here, but it's basically an immutable thing. Like if we, if we go and we fix a bug with the model uh, version, we throw away all other output previously made, we, we might keep, keep the same um, uh, version number because it's just corrected. Or if we, uh, if we add something to it that outputs an additional output, we might not change the version because it just expands what we have. It doesn't change the other ones. But in general, this is uh, this whole management of these things and traceability principles. Going to be able to go back. This output it's like um, provenance information um, in other spheres of IT. This output came from which version of the model? which random number seed and assumptions was that uh, run with, um, and which version of, of the software. This is often uh, valuable as well to know if there's been any you know, software change. So these are um, really important processes to have in mind. Documentation, there's this protocol that I'm privy to, and a fair number of our models have been created with this ODD plus protocol. Um, um, so uh, this is uh, overview um, and, and description and details, I believe it is. Um, the, the second E, I think it's description. In any case, um, uh, and, then, and then it was extended. This is by um, a modeler whose work I admire, uh, Volker Grimm, um, whose contributions in agent-based modeling have appeared in the pages of science, amongst other things. And um, he advocates using this as a, descript uh, as a way of describing models, the ODD protocol, or ODD plus. And uh, he has a, a book, which I like, some other modelers hate, called uh, Individual and Agent-Based Modeling, uh, that he wrote with Steve Railsback. Um, so it's Railsback and Grimm. Um, which, uh, which is, uh, I like it, um, uh, and it's uh, taught in that logo, um, so uh, worth, worth, worth looking at. I have a copy if, if you're interested, I could probably bring it. Um, but um, they, they use this ODD protocol, and that's the least bad of protocols I know. However, you know, we, we have to document things routinely um, for stakeholders or other needs. And uh, if you're interested, some of the students could show you examples of other model documentation which created. For example, Paul and Wade have recently been working on some model documentation for some ministerial stakeholders, which is more informal, but walks through a model at some level. Um, uh, good, good question. I don't know if that helps. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Other other questions related to. This, this may sound a little bit ethereal or abstract, but believe me, it's very specific. And if you have a model, you can almost always fruitfully ask, what do I want, if you're, if you're going to build a model, what do I want this next version of it to be endogenous, exogenous, ignored? And thinking about this explicitly, like in system dynamics, we often, this, by the way, this distinction is, it really goes back to system dynamics. I don't know. I think it comes out of that tradition, but it applies to right? um, You have the same issues. This uh, division is fruitfully diagram. Sometimes in model documentation, we do exactly this. This is this isn't part of ODD plus, but I like to have it to be very clear. When someone reads our a description of our model. You know, what things is it calculated, which things are its options. Some of the most frustrating things I've encountered in the modern world, I know Narges has encountered this as well, and some of her reading of the literature is sometimes when a model is described at a very high level, you're obscure, like, is it is it endogenizing a certain factor or is that a fixed assumption? For example, um, uptake rate for you know teenagers with easy grades, right? Um, you can matter, imagine a model of uh, these super use where that is, um, uh, uh, is fixed. It's age specific effect that those models have had before. Um, but you might ask, well, 
wait a minute, I mean, this age-specific rate thing, maybe that, that's just a proxy for peer effects and, and sort of social network effects. And the fact that you know, certain high uptake at certain ages may, may in fact be a, a phenomena we wish to characterize using the model because we're interested in you know, peer, um, peer interventions for teenage smokers. Um, in which case, maybe you want to unpack that into an endogenous effect um, um, involving you know, peer pressure in, in, in networks and the fact that if I have friends who are e-cigarette users, maybe I'm more likely to become an e-cigarette user. So, um, you know, almost, uh, almost any model, we, we will often fruitfully be thinking about this and, and asking what is central to model purpose? What's the next highest priority? This is what incremental model development force you to do. It's no longer what should be in the model and what shouldn't be. And it's, it's like, what should I put in next? And, um, you know, should I put in something that's as exogenous or should I put something that is endogenous? And often you can get the stakeholder feedback. So why would you include a model, um, a thing in the model at all? Well, if you can't capture key dynamic behavior that, that is absolutely central to your goals without it, you need to capture the effects of interventions. Maybe you need to target an intervention according to number of times someone has been to the SDI clinic before. You want to you have uh, high risk patients that are focused on. You need to keep track of how many times they've been to the, uh, to the SDI clinic before. And that probably means an individual level model for many aspects of history. Um, you're concerned about how it will be affected by an intervention. You need to look at, you know, effects on um, on someone's um, uh, quality of life, or or uh, or a risk of, of morbidity and some complication. Um, you're concerned how it's associated with uh, intervention outcome. You mentioned trends for effects. Um, uh, if it's observable, so this is actually a motivation. If you have something observable from the, from the real world, you have some data on it, and you want the model to be able to compare with that data, that's a reason, one motivation. It's not, it's not always the defining motivation, but it's a motivation for considering putting it in the model. Or it's essential for stakeholder credibility. Um, uh, why would you want to put things in as endogenous? Well, here you got to be really careful because it gives extra flexibility, uh, greater robustness, and, and translation to other contexts. So, extra flexibility in capturing effects of interventions or other other um, contexts. Um, you know, so by representing peer effects on smoking rather than assuming it's fixed by age, you might be able to examine, for example, broader set of interventions or or other exogenous scenarios that involve posit different um, social environment. But greater endogeneity often requires greater theory um, to tap into greater theory and implementation. I will mention this. This is an important sociological phenomenon. Ladies and gentlemen, I know you might think our modelers all look alike, um, uh, but the fact is, we, there's very different attitudes towards modeling. And one thing that I'll share with you is there are certain quarters of modeling where there's very strong social norms around what goes into a model as exogenous or which is not. Case in point, Wade was actually on this call. Um, we recently had uh, an eminent modeler who articulated, uh, as part of an advisory panel, a very strong normative statement about when you're allowed to put something in as endogenous or not. What he said is either, he said, either you need a previous model that put it in as endogenous, or you need to make a case based on theory that this is, um, uh, that this is something that is plausibly important and, uh, and in fact, in an operating process in the world, there's some strong evidence to believe that, it, that it, 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 it captures some feature of the situation and that's important. Um, or you need to have data that's better explained by this feature, this, and by putting it as endogenous, that it be allows the, better, the model to better account for features. Um, and 
And that was a very strong, pithy summary of the norms in that area of modeling that he operates in as to why you put something in as endogenous. Um, you, you need to have one of those um, one of those operative things. And actually, those aren't too far off from matching some of my points here. For example, if you want to capture the effects of an intervention um, uh, and you believe this is an important you know, component of the causative pathways associated with capturing those effects, that would be a, a sort of theoretical-based reason for putting it in there. Um, so endogenous factors require quite a lot of thinking, quite a lot of effort. Okay, um, I want to talk about a spectrum between models. Endogenous, greater endogeneity does not, does not go along with more complication in the model. There are classes of models out there, and I would cite microsimulation models, which are, have many moving parts, which are very, uh, very articulated in terms of what they include. They have many factors included in the model, but, uh, but they have minimally endogenous factors. There's a lot of statistical relationships assumed between different factors, and transition times, and it's not very endogenous. It's, it's, it's complicated, there's a lot of things going on, and there are some endogenous factors, but they're limited commonly to observables, the things that are observed in the world uh, directly, not latent factors. By contrast, in a lot of agent-based modeling as traditionally practiced, um, in, in that, um, that sub-area of individual-based modeling, the focus is often on the causal pathways, latent factors, um, and, uh, and we have observables, but they are not, most things in the model are not observable. Most things in the model are latent. Um, uh, and uh, here, we might have impacts of interventions that are mediated by, by pathways. So we don't just say, this intervention lowers the smoking rates among teenagers by this amount. We say, this intervention intervenes on social networks through peer educators in this certain way, and that ripples through to a change, an endogenous change in, um, in smoking rate, for example, and uptake rate, initiation rate. Um, and here, often there's an emphasis on model capture and theory. A lot of these uh, minimally endogenous models that are very rich, like microsim models, it's not so much that theory is being captured as much as it's emphasized uh, over here for ABM. So just be aware, in the broader space that might be characterized as ABM or individual-based modeling, there are differences between models, and they don't cleave across the, you know, is it a big model or a small model? You have big models that are minimally endogenous, and you have small models, smaller models that are heavily endogenous, heavily. Um, okay, I want to characterize this other distinction between caricature models or stylized models, uh, on the one hand, or theory building models, to use Ross's term, which I really like, via theory explication models. By the way, in system dynamics, um, I've heard Jack Homer refer to these as theory models, theory-based or uh, theoretical models, I think is the term he likes to use. And these are theory explication models there. You have an established theory that you take and run with it. You say, we're going to capture in the model this theory of, of, of behavior, you know, um, Porch's theory of, of uh, polyvagal theory of, of, of interaction for sympathetic and, and um, parasympathetic nervous systems, and, and we're going to follow its implications when we simulate behavior based on it. Theory building models are often sharpening thinking. These are about the sharpening of the thinking. How could just these two factors um, um, uh, interact? Now, one thing that you will, there's fighting words here. I will utter some fighting words, okay? And maybe people will send me flame, flames or they'll troll me or something online. Um, they won't like it. Um, there's a camp of modeling who believes that models um, always need data to be valid. There's another camp of, model, uh, of modeling that argues that you can fruitfully build theoretical models with very little empirical data. And you can get great insights even though you have little data. 
Um, and by the way, this has impacts at a practical level because you'll see certain modelers say, there's not enough data in this area, you can't build a model in that area. And you'll let others say, no, actually, because there's not much data, this is when we need the models the most because we want to build theory. We want to build some understanding on the little data we have. We want to make use of the, the little data we have in the richest possible way and interpreting what could that mean about the underlying situation. So, so this is a contentious area. And, um, and there are some modelers who, who do only these sort of models. I've heard certain prominent modelers tell me. <laughs> I've, I've been privileged to some really interaction, interesting interactions between modelers who are, uh, who are very different in styles, interacting. And um, one, one, I remember one, uh, one um, notable exchange where a modeler was saying, look, you're toy-based models. This is like amateur science. Um, he said, you know, you really need big, just like you need big telescopes to resolve, you know, cosmic uh, phenomenon, um, rather than, you know, little, little four inch reflector, or reflectors or refractor telescopes. You need big science of modeling to really get things done. And these toy models are all nice for learning and so on, but they're not really serious science. Um, they're not really advancing it. And then, um, uh, some other modelers in the room who are very much on this side said, look, we've been jilted at this off at uh, this altar of, of big models too too frequently. We put our faith in these big models and been bitterly disappointed by them. And we believe the way to advance science is by sharpening our thinking, advancing an understanding of, of smaller models that carry a punch and that tell uh, a compelling story about interaction of certain factors without claiming to be you know, comprehensive descriptions of certain phenomena in society. And so um, you know, we, we believe that, uh, that the, the way to advance, advance science with modeling is largely on smaller, stylized models that help us think more judiciously about certain processes, but don't aspire or claim to be a, a systematically comprehensive approach for caring, characterizing health phenomena in a certain area. And um, I thought it was a, a, a very interesting exchange. Um, uh, I must say, I, I, hew, I do a lot of work on this side. I do a lot of work on this side. I, I do quite a bit of modeling, and in my modeling, even if I don't publish something over here, I find myself building a little model to clarify like, like, So I can understand what's going on here, I build a little model. And often these models start over here, and they kind of evolve as, as you add features in. And, and you know, you, you sometimes see new phenomena, and then you might build a little model of it that just has those two or three things and then and see if it captures these features you've noticed. So I tend to go back and forth from the left and the right hand side of this uh, of this uh, uh, continuum. And uh, I'm sure there's people who would find that worthy of appro uh, approbation, but um, I, I'm not asking for their blessing. Um, actually, I think people who uh, fairly open to it. Quite a few modelers are pragmatic, I think, and go back and forth. Certainly someone like Ross Hammond, I've seen him operating on both sides of the spectrum. And a lot of models, modelers these days in my generation have that requisite flexibility. Okay, so I mentioned some things. I have some examples here, but uh, time is running on, and, and I, I do want to uh, uh, move on to some uh, additional items here. But um, Suffice it to say that I have some slides which, which further explicate some of these ideas. So, you know, um, look, if you want to examine the effects of condom use promotion, you, you want to represent something about how transmission risk changes with condoms, right? If, if, if you have a model of, of, of transmission of HIV in a population or of STIs, um, and you want to evaluate an intervention which, which posits uh, distribution of condoms, I mean, Somehow the two have to come together. The rubber needs to meet the road. You know, you gotta represent something about how condoms affect transmission risk. 
for you to understand the outcome. It's, it's pretty obvious there's sometimes certain pathways which need to be represented. But you'd be surprised if you think about an intervention focused models, a lot of the time, think about the interventions will drive the need to have certain pathways in your model. And those will end up being major considerations for how you build that model. It's sort of, we need this, we need that, we need that, we can't deal without that. And um, your, your final model may, in large, a, a lot of it may come from just this reasoning about you know, interventions, your interests, in if it's an intervention focused model. Um, or smoking, I mentioned these different levels of, of need and, and depending on what the goal of the model is, if you want to understand the effects of you know, peer educators on, on teenage social networks and so on, maybe you want to make you know, prevalence of smoking um, uh, impact uh, uptake rates. Um, uh, if you want to if you want to have uh, some understanding of um, how changes in availability of cigarettes and pricing of cigarettes might affect teen smoking, probably including something about preferences would be needed. Um, um, Jin Yang has this nice model of cigarette and e-cigarette interactions. Um, but if we want to understand something about how, and using it, thinking about it, if we want to understand something about how exposure to e-cigarettes leads to changes in nicotine tolerance levels which feed on to use of regular cigarettes, we need to expand that to have some pathways involving that. Okay, um, so these were some uh, comments, uh, a few super high level comments. Um, model purpose is, is key for, for um, to use, as John Sturman says, as a logical knife to cut away unnecessary complexity. But which complexity, like a surgeon, which complexity you carry away, you cut away, is something you need to exercise some care on. Right? You can't cut away um, arbitrarily. Um, uh, I had talked about the modeling process, and I had urged a few key principles. Adding factors doesn't yield to more insight. Often it will inhibit it. Um, it may not be needed for your model purpose. Maybe your model is a theory building model, not a theory explication model. Um, uh, and you got to be especially careful of this with agent-based modeling. Those from different backgrounds should realize you're coming to a tradition which is fewer the constraints that would traditionally bind you. And so it's especially one where you have to be very cautious about adding things in. Um, and hence adding them in incrementally. Um, there's high opportunity cost for adding things in. And generally being a bit skeptical, am I going to need it? Let's learn first if it's needed is a good attitude. It says you ain't going to need it. Um, incremental model development is the order of the day. Adding things in one by one. You're not going to be just dealt with a super confusing end product of the model. You'll be seeing what each addition changes about the model. You'll find issues with that addition sooner. You'll be able to get stakeholder feedback and sharpening of what you think is the next highest priority. And you'll be able to always have something in hand that could be valuable. And you can add in additional causal pathways over time as time and stakeholder support uh, and uh, theory uh, allows you to do so. Um, and I articulated some questions, one of the key ones being about interventions and about, um, uh, about the levels of, of theory, um, or excuse me, of, of causal pathways that you need to capture dynamic behavior of interest. Um, um, I articulated this trifold this, um, uh, characterization, endogenous factors, endogenous factors, and this is absolutely central to, to um, modeling enterprise, dynamic modeling enterprise, in keeping it in mind and revisiting it and being conscious when you have, say something is in the model, you want to be more specific. Is it produced by the model or is it told to the model? These are absolutely central. Okay. Um, so a few um, 
a few key factors there. I had further comments. But just be aware there's many distinctions we use to distinguish models, including an endogeneity distinction and a kind of simplicity uh, distinction and, and a, a sort of theory building your, uh, versus theory explication model. Um, hope that's um, helpful. Um, maybe I'll just note again there's more exhaustive lists of motivations for building models. I list some earlier, but they include explaining observed phenomena, not looking at counterfactuals. They, they include sharing and understanding the situation. They include bringing stakeholders together for dialogue. Uh, they include just thinking through interaction of different factors in a complex way. Um, they include examining the effects of interventions. They include prioritizing data collection based on differential sensitivity of a model to certain assumptions. Um, these are just a small number. Try to be aware of what you're seeking to get out of this model. One question I often like to start my modeling projects with for stakeholders is, what would a successful model be for you as a stakeholder? What would be a success of this modeling project? Um, what would you want to get out of this modeling project? It's not always a research question. It's not always a problem that they are trying to solve in the world. Um, and sometimes this allows for a more general discussion of the goals of modeling, the points they're seeking to, to address with the modeling, et cetera. So what would a successful modeling project uh, be? What would it give you? Um, is, is an important question. Okay, so those are those are some comments on model co conceptualization. I hope you find them helpful. It is a uh, gnarly and sometimes amorphous area, but I've given you a set of principles which, if I had known them when I started out modeling, I would have.